the viewers get? Oh, I got one. All right. I got one today. Uh, you got what? Nine twentieths? Oh, I put a G on there. Yeah, I think it's nine twentieths. It would be nine twentieths. Okay, nine twentieths. We multiply straight across, right? Couldn't get much easier than that. Multiply straight across. Multiplication of fractions has got to be the easiest fractions thing you could possibly do. Right? Okay. Um, then, just to confirm, what's this one come out to be? Both over 35. Right. And simplifying will come uh, a little bit later, but for now we're doing great. Okay. Now what? Y squared over 2. Two y squared. Y squared. Wait, can you have y squared over 2? Say what? Well, if it's 5x squared over 2 Oh, I think what you're thinking of, and it's not a matter of can and can't, but of, uh, yeah, preference. It's really just preference. So what you're thinking of is square roots. Thinking of not having square roots in the denominator. Um, and we'll just leave that for later. But what you're thinking of is square roots. We don't want those in the denominator. Not because it's wrong, but because it's our preference. As mathematicians. Okay, before anyone says anything, how do we multiply these fractions? Straight across, straight across, straight across, like that. Okay, so I multiply the numerator by this numerator and the denominator by this denominator. So I multiply the numerators together, what do I get? Uh, uh, two two Good. And I'm going to multiply this by this, then it wouldn't make a lot of sense to just multiply the x by 2. The whole thing's got to get multiplied by 2. Okay, the denominator. Yeah, 3 times 5. You satisfied with that? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, then let's multiply these together. Okay. Again, we multiply straight across, always straight across. Multiply x by x plus 6, that means distributing. And over what? Good, satisfied? Everybody agrees? Okay. How about this one? 6 x y uh -huh. plus 2y plus 3. Good. Over. So when we distribute, what do we wind up with in a new numerator? I got x squared minus 2x minus 3. Okay. Over. Okay. Good? <coughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay. Let's give me some room. We move this over. Certainly get more complicated, um, but just <sighs> how much more complicated do we want to make it just so we can see if we can do it? If you just remember to multiply straight across with your fractions, that's all you need to do. And don't get too uh, mixed up. Don't try and get common denominators, right, when you're multiplying. It's a common mistake. You don't need them. And in fact, if you get common denominators, you're just making more for yourself in the end, because at the end you'll have to simplify. So, speaking of simplification, um, I'm going to simplify some fractions. Okay? And then I'm going to explain why you can simplify, or what it is that you did to simplify your fractions. So, uh, let's just start with that. Start out easy, you just, just get blurted out even if you can explain what it is you're doing. What it is that you're, what are you doing to simplify this fraction? Right, right, 30. 
What's that? Divide by three. Divide them each here. by three. Okay. How about um, <coughs> does it take double? It does. Two x cubed. Divides, it's a little bit vague, right? Just we got to be really specific. And uh, if you if you get technical, we're gonna say that um, uh, if a divides b, that's what this vertical line means in this context. Then uh, this symbol means there exists. Capital E that's backwards means there exists um, an integer. Such that, let's say an integer, let's give it a name, an integer k, such that a times k equals b. Does that make sense? a can divide into b, and we must be able to multiply a times some other number to get b. And the same would go for k, in fact, in this case. If, uh, if this is true, then k also divides b. Because k, that is also true for k. A is the, the number, the integer that uh, k multiplies by to give b. So when we start to think about simplifying fractions, this is where we really start to run into trouble on a, on a larger scale. Um, we have to think, is there a common factor? And by that, is there something that we can, can we write this thing as a multiple of two different things and then cancel out that thing that's multiplied by, okay? So, we had x squared plus 2x plus y over x squared. Can you simplify that? No. No. Because 5 does not have an x. Okay. So the only thing that, like, what our i jumps to is we would like to cancel out maybe this x squared this x squared, okay? But that's what this is all about. Every time you just cancel out this x squared and this x squared, then kitten leaps in a stronger version of this uh, theorem or something worse happens to the kitten. But I just decided not to put that one up. But it's very bad to do that. Not just bad, you know, it's just, it's not correct. But let's talk about why can you not cancel the x squared here? Um, or maybe you could cancel something here. Because they all have at least one factor of x. Okay. Yes, they all have a factor of x. Okay. Now, if we want to be really clear about this, then let's come over to this guy here. What we're doing here, when you say we divide by three in both, we're really writing this as three times two, and three times three. Okay. And then we're recognizing that really, this can be, just like we can multiply fractions together straight across, if the fraction is made up of multiplication, then we can break it apart into two fractions. Does that make sense? Okay. So these can become two separate fractions that will be mul multiplying together. If you multiply them together, you get this thing. And if you actually multiply the numbers together, you get that thing there. Okay. So if we separate them like this into two different fractions, what does this fraction turn into? It's one. Yeah, three divided by three. Anything divided by itself is one. Okay, so this three divided by three is just one. One times two thirds is two thirds. Now that is step-by-step, step, mathematically, 100% like explained. 
Anything else you've seen is just a shortcut designed to, to try and help you out, but for some, it's messing you up more than it's helping. Because what it turns into, if, if, I, uh, if I just see this and I say, oh, I just cross these things out, if you don't understand what's going on here, maybe in a group of people who just try to cancel them out. Why? Because they're the same number. I just see them, they're the same, I cross them out. When you see the same thing, you cross it out. That's not the case. Not just when you see the same thing. So if we come over here, what we want to show is that this number this numerator and this denominator have a factor or are divisible by the same thing. Okay. Just like we say it right here. So if that's the case, if we want to cancel out x, then we need to be able to show the numerator as x times something and the denominator as x times something so that the x can divide the x and become a multiple of 1. So the numerator can be written as x times what? Uh, x squared plus 2. And the denominator can be x times what? X. x. So now we have x over x times x squared plus 2x plus 3 over x. x divides x. You get a 1 there. 1 times this is just itself. So. Start with those two. Simplify those as much as we can. Right. Can you simplify the first fraction? Is it possible? No. Okay. What are you going to cancel out? Two. Two. So you must be able to write the denominator and the numerator both with, you know, in the form two times something. Okay. So the numerator is two times what? X squared plus two. And the denominator? X. Two times x. So we write it as 2 over 2 times x squared plus 2x plus 4 over x gives that. This is it. Final, final addition, final result. Okay? We're not trying to cancel out that x, right? Because the numerator cannot be written as x times something. Okay. How about the second? Okay, so we can't factor anything out of here. We can't factor anything out of here. But would it be possible to cross this out, to cancel this out with something in the numerator? The only way that you could cancel out, say, this 2 is if you could write the numerator and denominator as 2 times something, 2 times something. So the same would be true here. The only way you could cancel out this x plus 1 is if the numerator could be written as plus 4 times. Can we write this as x plus 1 times something else? times x plus 2 does uh, equal x squared plus 3x plus 2. So we can cancel them out. We get x plus 2 is the final result. For simplification, remember, you, you cannot just cancel things out because they're the same, because you see two things that are the same, or even if you see two things that share the same factor, like 2x and 2x squared, they have a factor of 2. 
right? But it's not about this and just any old thing in the numerator that I choose. It's about the denominator and the numerator as a whole, the whole thing. It's not the whole thing. The whole thing can't be written as two times something. And we can't simplify it. Let's try even, just make this up here, two x squared plus four x plus seven. Because yeah. no. uh, if you try to factor out a 2 like this, 7 is not divisible by 2, right? But if I wanted to force it, couldn't I make the numerator 2 times something? Yeah. Like I would distribute 2 and come out with this somehow. Put x squared plus 2x plus 3.5 or 7 over 2. And now we have a 2 down it. Now we have a common factor of 2. Okay, so we cancel out common factors, uh, common factors between the numerator and denominator. So watch yourselves on those if you see, if you're dealing with a fraction, because your algebra skills need to be just really solid as you go on through pre-calculus and calculus. So something simple like that, make sure that if you're going to cancel something out, it's because it has a common factor between the numerator and denominator. Um, let's do uh, a challenging one here. Would that be in our interest to write it that way rather than the way it's written right now? It's going to help because you can see if either one of those factors are like two. Yes, right. We're looking for factors. So anytime we can write, rewrite a numerator denominator as factors, things that are multiplied together, that's going to be the only way that we can cancel something out. So we have to factor it. Uh, when we're talking about something really easy, like six ninths, we factor it in our heads, and we cancel it out in our heads, and it's really fast. If we were just starting, we might need to write it as 3 times 2 or 3 times 3. And here, the polynomials, you can cancel out this Because the denominator is what? Uh, x plus 7 times x plus 2 times x plus 2. Times x plus 2? So we have to uh, really draw it out here. x plus 2 uh, over x plus 2 times x plus 3 over x plus 7. Cancel x plus 3 over x plus 7. Certainly. Because whenever I plug in for x, say I plug in 5. Okay, I plug in 5 here, I get 8. Here, I get uh, 12. Here, I get 7 and 7. 7 divided by 7, 1. No matter what I plug in for x, I'll always get 1 number divided by itself. The only thing, what's, what's the one thing I could plug in for x? here in this uh, fraction? Negative? No. Negative two. Negative's okay. What's negative two? Negative two. Why can you not plug in negative two? That would just be zero. Can't divide by zero. Can't divide by zero. Negative two plus two would be zero. Can't divide by zero. Uh, what well, can you not plug in for x? You know, I mean, whatever you plug in for x, you got to plug in for all the x's. But because of this fraction, what can you not plug in for x? So we can cross these out as long as we say uh, x cannot be negative 2 or negative 7. Because according to the original, you can't have negative 2 be x. So to simplify. times that if, if a student just had a clear understanding of what a factor was, they wouldn't have nearly the confusion that they have about lots of different subjects. Simplifying fractions, 
dividing polynomials, like so many things, if we understood what a factor was, we wouldn't have as nearly as much trouble as we have. So find a common factor, something times something else. Okay. Okay, so how do we handle these division? So in this case, we would take what and multiply by what? Two times, uh, yeah, two over one times five over three. So five over three times thirds. Okay. Um, if I wrote it like that. writing these, we're reading these. Would it make a difference? Would 2 over 1 times 5 over 3, you know, would 2 divided by 3 fifths be any different from 2 thirds divided by 5? Yeah. Think so? Because 2 thirds divided by 5 would be um, 2 thirds times 1 over 5. Uh -huh. So 2 over 15. Maybe not the same as 10 thirds, so yeah, it makes a big difference. And it's not the same. It needs to be clear, what, what are we dividing? Maybe a bigger line, maybe parentheses, something like that it needs to be clear. Right. How about this guy? That'd be 6 over 1 times 2 over 3. 2 would be 12 over 3. And I need to be 4. Okay. And how about this one? Good question. It should be communicated clearly by whoever is giving this to you what's happening. Alright, so what do we do first so that we can keep all this stuff straight? Oh, um, we rewrite it, right? Yeah. yeah. As? To. Cancel the two and the three? No. Cross cancel? Can we cross cancel when we have fractions? No. Like here, I could have canceled the six and the three to start with. And that would be one, and this would be two, and then uh, two times two would be four. So should we cancel the two and the three? No. I forget if you can cancel out congregates or not. Well, the only thing we can cancel out are common what? The identical things, right? Yeah. So, if they have a common factor, then certainly we should cancel them out. Do they have a common factor of say two? Because you want to cancel out the two. Yeah. They do. Oh wait, no, no they don't. because it's not. You'd have to be able to write this as two times something. something. Yeah. And this one has two times something. Now, if we want to make this look worse, right? The goal here would be simplifying. But if we want to make it look worse, we could do uh, x plus three halves. There's fractions inside of fractions. So let's not do that. We'll leave it. And the same goes for three. We can't write it as three times something. Right? We can't write really any of these as anything times anything. None of these are factorable. Okay? So, no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't cancel out the two. We shouldn't cancel out the three. We should only cancel out when we have common factors. Okay? And how do I know that, say, two is a factor that I can cancel out? Because I can write it as two times something. If I can't, then we'll leave it be. 
what do we get here when we multiply x plus 2 times 2x plus 3? 2x squared plus 7x plus 6. Plus, what did you say? Uh, 7x plus 6. Plus 6, sounds good to me. And then 10x squared minus x minus 1. Minus x, yeah, minus x minus 21. Sounds good. And the key to being successful as we move into the future is to remember the things that I'm telling you now when I'm not necessarily setting you up to, you know, to be in the context of a simplification problem, a fraction simplification problem. You gotta recognize it as you're working through some bigger problem and say, oh, I don't, I can't cancel those because I can't write this as two times some parentheses or, you know, five times some parentheses or x plus one times some parentheses or x times some parentheses. It's not a factor, so I'm not gonna cancel it out. A factor of the entire numerator, the entire number. Go through some add subtract. We're gonna start, you know, with numbers, and we're gonna go with variables, and then uh, I'm gonna have you guys play a little game, um, just for fun and to make observations. Okay, so um, say I'm gonna add three fifths plus two thirds. Okay. First of all, can I cancel these threes out? Yeah. No way. Oh, it's not good. Because the only reason we would cancel a three with a three is because the three is dividing the three. That's not the case here. Right? The only way we could get these fractions to come together and cancel out those factors of three would be if we were multiplying the fractions together. We're not, we're adding them. The reason we can cancel let's say three fifths times two thirds. I think the reason why you want to cancel that 3 with that 3 is because you see a 3 in a numerator and a 3 in a denominator, they're the same number, so you want to cancel them out. But you don't ask yourself, I don't think, why can I cancel things out and, and can I do it in this situation? You can here. Why? Because, let me back this up, because I can write it as 3 times 2 over 5 times 3. I can rewrite this as 3 times 2 over 3 times 5, using the associative property of multiplication. And then I can rewrite this as 3 over 3 times 2 over 5. And 3 divided by 3 is 1. That doesn't happen over here. To even get these fractions to go together, or interact with each other, is to do what? Common denominator. Common denominator. You've got to add them together by getting a common denominator. The denominator will be what? 15. 15. So we're going to get... How are we going to get this to be a 15? Times 3. Times. Then you have to times uh, multiply the common. Okay, now why? Why do we multiply the numerator by 3 as well? Isn't it kind of, it's like the same thing as an equal sign when you, when you do both, you have to do it to both sides? It's the same in that it's like a rule that we know we should do, but why do you do the same thing on both sides of an equation? Make it true. So, it, so it's, yeah, the true thing, so it's like... So it's still balanced. Yeah. Yeah. Um, same could kind of be said here. This is still kind of balanced. Um, yeah, the same argument could be made. What What is this though? One. One. And so, can we multiply it by one? Maybe can we can, no. Well, I mean, if I take any number and I multiply it by one, what happens? It's the same. This stays the same, right? I cannot change what this number is worth, how big it is, where it is on the number line. I can't change that. If I multiply by one, I don't change that. Nothing changes, okay? And if I multiply it by a convenient form of one, three over three, then now I make them comparable to each other, right? Because I multiply this one by five, so they get 15 in the denominator, and a five in the numerator. By the way, we could, we could go over why we can it's almost like magic that we can multiply fractions together and get the right answer by just multiplying straight across. It seems like an awfully convenient thing to be able to do. Why? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about why do we multiply fractions straight across? No, maybe they haven't. That's a tricky one. And at some point you have to kind of accept things. If I ask why does one plus one equal two, that's not a, a trivial question but it's one where we can pretty easily accept. Maybe you can easily accept that we can multiply fractions together straight across. Um, but something
thing to ponder over, and it's a it's, it's a good question to ask, a good question to answer. So all we're doing here is we're multiplying this by one. No problem, nothing changes. It's still three fifths, right? It's still as big as the three fifths fraction when we have it as nine over fifteen. It's still just as big as it was. A ratio of three of these to five of these. And here, when we have ten fifteenths, still for every uh, two of these, there's three of these. The re relationship between the numerator and denominator is the same. But now we have the same denominator, so we have 19. 19, so if you ask yourself, why do you need common denominators? Some of you should be able to answer. Why do we need common denominators? Why do we go through the rigmarole of getting the, the numbers at the bottom of the fraction to be the same? try to add three-fifths and two-thirds without getting a common denominator, what might you say was the answer? Five-eighths. Maybe you'd say five-eighths if you have a numerator and denominator. If you don't ask, what does a fraction mean, right? Because if you, if you do that, you're not really asking what is a fraction and what does it mean? Am I, is that fair to say? I mean, really. If you say that three fifths plus two thirds is five eighths, you either have forgotten to ask or have never asked, what is a fraction? You never understood what a fraction was. So, could, could someone tutoring some fifth grader, and they do that, you say, oh no, that's not what we do, we got a common denominator, and you say, they, they ask me why. some point, this stuff can be boiled down to simple pictures. And we have to generalize those pictures and those principles and that kind of thing because, you know, how do I explain this to someone when I'm trying to take x plus 3 over x minus 7 plus uh, 2x minus 6 over 4x plus 5? Like, how could I possibly tell even someone who understands what x's are and all that kind of stuff, why we can't just add this together and say that this is uh, 3x minus 3 and 5x minus 2. You know, why is it not that? But it's kind of hard to, it's almost impossible, I would say, at least for me. I, I can't explain it to somebody, all these x's and things. I'm going to take it all the way back, the simplest fractions that you ever encounter, and we'll just be simple numbers, right? With the, the numbers not being too big. 
reason why we can't add them together and get five eighths, we could just see a picture of it. Like Tristan was saying, in the case of the three fifths, one fifth, it means it's, it would take five of these size pieces to make one, to make the number one, to make a whole pie, to make a whole bar, if you want to use bars instead of pies, right? cut those into five pieces, however you want to look at it. So I'll try my best to cut these into five pieces. And then the thirds, it would take three, three equal sized pieces of thirds to make a whole pie. So if I add, if I try to add three fifths to two thirds, I can clearly see I don't have five of anything. I got three of one thing, two of another thing. I cannot put them together and say that I have anything. And if I do say I have five of something, I've completely taken the identity of the original fractions away. Kind of like said that I had uh, two apples and three oranges, and I said I have five fruits, five pieces of fruit. That's, that's true, but now you don't know how much of each fruit you have to begin with. You don't even know that there's how many different kinds of fruit are, there are. Like It's not equal to what you started with. The information is lost. But we can make fractions into the same thing. In this case, we'll cut each of these five pieces into three pieces each. That means 15 for the whole thing. And this one, we'll take each of these three pieces and cut them into five pieces. That, that will make this pie be made of 15 uh, equally sized slices. And then we can compare the two and add them together. Right? In this case, if I cut these into three each, then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of those fifths or fifteenths. If I cut these into five pieces each, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of those fifteenths and nineteenths. Now they're the same thing and I can add them together and compare them. Uh, if that's never occurred to you to ask or if it's never been explained to you in any way, uh, it's worth your time to, to go over that. Explain to yourself why do you need to get common denominators before you add or subtract fractions. If you don't, you're just trying to match together things that aren't the same. Clearly, like, let's look at it being five eighths. When you look at the picture, it's completely ridiculous. Like, look at these three pieces. These three pieces that I've colored in red, they look to be a little bit more than half. These two thirds are clearly more than half of the pie. So when I add them together, I should, if I take just a little more than a half and just a little more than a half, I should definitely get more than a whole pie. But adding together this way, I get five eighths, which is less than a pie. It's just, that is just even barely bigger than one half of a pie. So I've taken something that's more than a half, more than a half, added together, and gotten something that is just barely more than a half. That doesn't seem right at all. I should have at least one and some more. So even looking at that picture makes that look silly. And then, again, we go into the explanation of why can't you put them together? Because they're not the same. Knowing that now, knowing we need to get a common denominator, we can't just add the numerators and the denominators together. And if we had ever taken a minute to have explained to us or, or ask why, when we multiply, why do we multiply straight across? Then trying to add straight across would be less tempting. So like that, that doesn't pan out, that doesn't make any sense. So let's see, let's. Before we can add two fractions together, we must find what? Common denominator. Okay, so we come back to this example because it is possible to see why we need to get a common denominator. Okay. We practiced and we practiced and we practiced through fifth and sixth, seventh, eighth, I don't know which grade, but you just keep doing fractions year after year after year, right? And the hope is that you're continually like strengthening your skills. But if you didn't ever learn why you need to get common denominators, you're just more like continually doing something you don't understand and like maintaining a certain level of confusion uh, or ignorance, just like not knowing what, why, why do we do this, okay? Again, why is we want to get the, we need
need to add together pieces of equal size, which we aren't doing if we add three halves and five thirds in this way, or two, three fifths and, and two thirds in this way. Um, so how do we find the common denominator? Well, we multiply by one. Right? We essentially just multiply each number, each fraction by one, by three over three, by five over five. Okay? But we do it, in, we multiply by one in such a clever way that what winds up happening is the denominators wind up being identical. Okay? In this case, 15s. Both well, get to be 15s. And at least in this very concrete way, we can see, well, like this is still slightly abstract, but more concrete way. We can see why that was needed, why we needed to get common denominators, why that whole thing needed to happen. So here, where it becomes nearly impossible, I would say, or at least really impractical, to try and explain why you need common denominators, we know that we do. We know that we need that. So then it just becomes a matter of, well, I know that I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator of each fraction by the same thing, because I'm, I'm essentially going to be multiplying by one. I think, what can I multiply each denominator by to get the same thing in each denominator, right? So, what can I multiply this by? What can I multiply this by so that we'll wind up getting the same thing in each of the denominators? Could, could you just multiply 3 over x by 3x? Okay, so 3x here. And here? Yeah. Obviously, we've got to multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing, only because if we don't, then we are, you know, if we just multiply the denominator by 3x, we'd be changing what this fraction is, what it means, what it's worth, where it is on the, the number line. But if we multiply it by 1, then we're not changing that. What do we multiply this by? Can you just leave? Just leave it, or, you know, multiply it by 1 over 1, which is a silly thing to do, but. Or we just leave it. Okay, and so this one, this, this left fraction will become 9x. 9x. 3x squared plus 5 over 3x squared. Now they have common denominators, okay? It's hard to make this argument and, and, uh, or give an explanation when the denominator is, is 3x squared. It takes 3x squared pieces to make a whole. See, it becomes very difficult to explain. But now, okay, so the fractions are the same. We're, we're talking about the same thing. If we plug in the number for x, we have the denominators are, are identical, meaning that we're comparing equally sized pieces. We have 9x plus 5, 3x squared. Multiplying each denominator by something so that the denominator of each is the same. common denominator that's accomplished by multiplying each denominator by something. This is the only way that we can alter the denominator. We can't just add something to it. That's not how it works. Uh, we can only multiply it by something while also multiplying the numerator by the same thing. What will we multiply this by? What will we multiply this by? by x. If we multiply it by x, we'll get 2x squared y. So we'll have that factor of x squared like this one has. And what do we multiply this by? 2y. 2y. So now we'll have 2 times x squared times y, and then we'll have 2 times x squared times y. Multiply this by x, this by 2y. We get 5x over 2x squared y plus 4y over 2x squared y. Now the denominators are the same. Common, we have 20xy over, or sorry, not 20xy. We're adding them. So we have 5x plus 4y over 2x squared. Now, for 
actually a little bit into some territory we haven't really covered. This here, this would be like uh, getting into rational expressions, rational functions. Um, but certainly within our grasp to understand. So we must get a common denominator. And it would be really helpful if we could uh, remind ourselves why that is. Could explain it to a fifth grader when we're helping them with their homework. Why do I need to get a common denominator? Well, let me, let me break it down for you. Let's look at some really simple fractions, and I'll show you with a picture why we have to get the same denominator. So just a, a breakdown of a, of a subject that, if any little piece of it is uh, causing you problems, can really throw a speed bump in trying to solve a more difficult problem. Bigger problem. Um, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna have you guys pair up and play a game. And as you're playing the game, just say, "Hey, oh, I noticed this happens, or I think this will always happen if we keep playing this game forever." Um, that's, that's all we're gonna do. We're gonna play for a little while, and we'll just talk about some things and see if we can determine why they must be true or must be false. Or so uh, why don't you guys pair up, uh, and let's see. Yeah, there's enough to make pairs, just all pairs, numbers or three, just no numbers. So go ahead, pair up, go, go, go. Okay, so first I'll just show you, you don't need to start playing yet, I'll just show you. You start with two X's. So whoever goes first starts it off by, um, you can see there's four and four ends, so there's a total of eight ends here. Okay. And the first player can connect in any way they want to, two of the ends. Okay. Once you do that, once you draw, call it an edge, you have to put another slash like that. So that, this is like an X that, you know, maybe kind of, right? So you got two more ends. Next player could connect these two, or connect this one with itself, or anything like that. As long as every time you draw a line like this, or a curve, you, know, you put a, a slash through it. So I'll just do like this, connect these two, put a slash through it, you know, somewhere in the middle. And the next person could go from here to there, right? And so you just keep playing, and so you put a slash there. You keep playing until there's no more moves left, okay? Uh, so, play for, I would say, at least 10 minutes and just ask yourself questions and see if you can answer those questions. How do this game, how do this game is played, what is the nature of this game, is there a strategy to this game? Can we, there's no other observations you made, maybe, I mean, they could be related to this question. If you were allowed to cross lines, or could you learn some of the rules, or how? Uh, and the is there an end if you can cross uh, uh, lines? Is that a good way to ask that question? Yeah. Cross lines? Could you? Would there be an end? Could it go on forever? Um, other questions. What about like, is it better to go first or second? Starts first loses. Yeah, you went. Yeah, you you start first. starts first, you lose. When there's no more moves to make, so if there's no like ends to ends connect. You, then. If it ends on you, you lose. Once there, once there's like, <laughs> once there's no two ends to connect together, then okay. there you go. You so whoever's movable is that to you? I'm What? Because I went first every time. Yeah. I lost every time I started. You lost every time you started. 
You started a lot? Yeah. And you lost a lot? Yeah. Okay. Anybody who started win? Can you win? <laughs> it's you start. Question. I mean, you play a game. What do you want to do? Win. So you know, this is a game that you could set your friend up to always lose. Then. Yes. Okay. Does like the position of the X is all about, like X you put in the middle of the line matter? Oh, the position of, of like this guy right here that I make. Yeah. If I if I were to draw this, would it be more? Would it be better for me to put it here or here or here? Yeah. Okay. Does the uh, position of the new ends matter? Well, maybe let's start with. Um, well, I think this this. Does the game end after so many moves? Is a good question because let's say it ended after eleven moves. I'm just picking that number out of the air. If it ends after eleven moves, then would you want to start or go second? Because if you lost or win, huh? Technically, if you won or lost. But what would like if it if it always ended after eleven moves? Does that sound like a situation that you would guarantee to? You know, it sets, whoever starts or, or goes second, like definitely one of those guys is going to win every time. Does that make sense? You want to go first. You want to go first? Why is that? Because it would end, like the 11th move would be the player who went first. So uh -huh. when the next person tried to go, they would lose because they wouldn't win. So it's an odd number of moves. You want to go first. So like okay. You want to go first. Okay. So then it answers that question. Can you win if you start? Right? If it's a good yes or no, depending on how many moves it takes. Um, is there an end if you can cross lines? Let's think about that for a second. I don't think yeah. there would be. You always create two new ends, right? And so you couldn't just run out of like moves. Yeah, like if you could cross lines, then always there would be one more move if you just go like this. Yep. Add another one, do that. Yeah. Right? So really quickly we answer that question. There's no end if you can cross lines. Okay. So is there an end if you can cross lines? Uh, yeah. No. No, there's no end. Because you could always create, you could always connect the two things that you made from the previous move. Okay. So, we're going to run out of time. What I want you to do for homework is think about this. First of all, there's this thing. For, like, for anything that has what we're going to call um, vertices, okay, so like little points, you see how like each of these X's makes a point, mm -hmm. okay? Um, anything that has um, vertices and then what we call edges, so those are edges. edges. Anything that's like that we call a planar graph, and for any, any planar graph has something called the so I'll ask you what you think this is. So how would you say that name? Is it your construction? Yeah. The Euler actually which is, doesn't look like what it should be. The Euler characteristic. The Euler characteristic. I wrote it down because I can't remember. That. I, I have it yet at least. What do we call these things? You remember? Uh, vertices. Vertices. So the number of vertices minus the number of edges, like these are edges. Okay, so the number of vertices, and like in this halfway finished game or 
whatever percentage finished it is. One, two, three, four, five vertices, minus the number of edges, okay? And now, like, if I were to connect these two and put a line like that, I've made a vertex, and a, a vertex always separates edges. So when I do this, I actually have drawn two edges, two more edges by creating another vertex, okay? So minus the number of edges, uh, plus the number of faces, is always equal to 2. The number of faces, or what a face is, is any region that's fully contained by edges. Okay? So here's one, here's a face, here's a face that says 1, 2, 3, and also, like the whole outside that's not within there, that's also a face. Okay? So that counts as 1, 2, 3, 4 faces. So let's try the spoiler characteristic on what I've drawn so far. Okay? Vertices, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Minus the number of edges, uh, one, two, three, four, five, so six, seven, eight. Plus the number of faces is how many faces? Four. One, two, three, four. Okay, six minus eight. Negative two. Negative two plus four. Two. Uh -huh. it is two. The Euler characteristic works out. Okay. So I want you to think about this, and if you, if you make progress on this, that's all I would like to see. Consider this question. Does the game after uh, the same number of moves? Okay, let's call that number of moves M. Okay, call that number of moves M. Okay, and this is, is gonna lead into our uh, talk about functions. Functions are really important for people to understand. And they're, they're pretty simple, okay? So let's say, we wanted to use the Euler characteristic to see if we can nail down a number of moves that we can prove for sure has to exist. So let's think about creating three different functions, okay? For instance, you know how the game starts. Two vertices are drawn, right, with two x's, okay? So after m moves, right, if you, if you have gone 15 moves, how many vertices will there be? Because you know you, you add one every time you go. Okay. So, for instance, this is supposed to look like an equal sign. The number of vertices is equal to, well, what relationship does it have to have with the number of moves? If you go up one move, right, creating one edge and then a line creating another vertex. If you go one move, how many vertices are there? Three. One move, three vertices. How about after two moves? Four. Four. After five. three moves, five. Every move gives us one more vertex. One more vertex, right? Every time we draw an edge, we draw one more vertex. So the total number of vertex vertices after m moves. Like, how would I use m to calculate the number of vertices after m moves? The, the amount of moves plus the original plus two, which would be the amount plus two. The original. Yeah, because there's definitely this, you add as many edges as there are moves, and you started with, or sorry, vertices as there are moves, and you have started with two, right? So you start with two and you add m four. So consider the other two. Is there a way to figure out? And we're kind of like, m is representing this theoretical end number of moves. You're done, the game is over. So consider what that means, what implications can you draw? What does it mean that, that is, the game is over? Okay? And then, you can use that to prove that there are, that M is whatever number it is. If it even exists, if there is a certain number that it has to be. Okay? If you can prove that, then you'll be impressed and obviously it'll give you some extra credit for this really good. But if we can write, at least an equation for the number of edges. Okay? And that's, that's what I'd like to see. And then write an equation for the number of faces. You know, and then we can take all of those equations. M plus two can replace B. The equation for E can be replaced by whatever that is. And F can be replaced by whatever that is. And we can use it to calculate M. Because we know that all that stuff put together has to equal two every time it's a little right there. Or the characteristics. Or the okay. So give that some thought. Post this uh, on the 
Back one more five seconds so you can look at it. Damn it. You can play by yourself. You can you know, just draw the number. See if you can draw it out past a certain number of moves. And start to ask yourself why. Uh, does it maybe stop at a certain number?